everyone. I'm Richard Meir and I'm the head of the International Department at Lee Day. Welcome to this joint Amnesty International Lee Day discussion on, on human rights and toxic mining legacies in Southern Africa. Recent history is sadly replete with examples of multinational corporations abusing human rights and causing widespread environmental damage in the global south. In the Southern African region, mining operations have decimated the health and livelihoods of workers, communities and their environment. We've seen graphic evidence of this in our legal cases. Take the example of the South African operations of UK asbestos mining giant, Cape PLC, from 1913 to 1979, which caused an epidemic of asbestos-related disease in black miners and communities living in the vicinity and left a landscape covered in toxic dust and dumps. The government official described the employment of cobbers on the mines as follows. The raw material is hammered to separate the asbestos from the rock. And this work is carried out by women and children. And then according to a company secretary in the 1950s, he said it would be most uneconomical to employ fully grown men to do the work done by these miners, miners as in children. Uh, many of the seven and a half thousand asbestos victims that we represented in the Cape PLC case at the end of the 1990s had in fact been employed as young children on the mines. And then there was the environmental pollution with uh, the Cape Blue asbestos caused by the Cape Blue asbestos mill in Prisca in the Northern Cape of South Africa. According to an internal company report in 1962, at Prisca, the conditions around and about the mill are not good. The crusher is outdoors. It is quite obvious that a cloud of dust was being blown by a strong wind towards the town. Men were working below in a rain of dust. And again, in our legal case, we represented hundreds of families of mesothelioma victims, that's a cancer of the lining of the lungs caused by asbestos, who came from that specific area. Now, demand for asbestos in South Africa was driven by the US and Europe. Termination of asbestos mining in South Africa was due to the drying up of demand due to the fears for the health of US and European consumers, not the health of black miners. Uh, whereas US and UK victims were compensated from the 1970s onwards, Cape forth, fought tooth and nail before the 2003 settlement of the South African asbestos victims claims and still walked away from its environmental liabilities. Then we have what was described by a leading South African expert as a river of disease of silicosis and TB in South African gold miners and their communities, which also continued for decades, with mining companies being forced to cough up only recently after hard fought protracted litigation. All this is in stark contrast to the speedy response of BP to the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Nevertheless, some of the mining companies involved have waxed lyrically about their commitment to the rights of workers and the communities in which they operate. And this shocking state of affairs raises many questions, which we will discuss today, including why is or was such misconduct considered acceptable by these companies and why was it allowed to happen? Was this just a thing of a colonial past or is it still ongoing? Do grand human rights pronouncements by businesses reflect a genuine commitment or are they just paying lip service? Is the public in the global north that interested in the corporate mistreatment of communities in Africa? What is being or should be done by investors, governments and civil society and human rights lawyers to address these abuses and injustices? So these are the questions that we will the topics that we'll discuss this afternoon. I'm delighted to be joined today by four 
eminent speakers who can view these issues from directly relevant but different perspectives. Uh, Malaya Mwana Nyanda is the Johannesburg-based Deputy Director for Research for Southern Africa at Amnesty International. Malaya has led advocacy and campaign work in multiple countries and engaged with governments on public policy and human rights issues, including advising governments on developing progressive legislation to promote human rights and development. Malaya also grew up in Kabwe in Zambia, which we'll hear about in a while. Uh, David Olushoga is an award-winning author and presenter. He's currently the Professor of Public History at the University of Manchester. David's work has shaped a new direction for historical depiction on the small screen. David's work fronting pioneering series like A House Through Time, Black and British of Forgotten History and the World's War shines a light on the unrepresented aspects of history focusing on race. Winning the Specialist Factual BAFTA Award in 2016 for Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners solidified David as a leading voice in exposing Britain's history. Nicole Martins is the head of Africa and Middle East at the UN supported Principles for Responsible Investment based in Johannesburg. She is responsible for strengthening existing relationships and developing new relationships with stakeholders in the investment space. Nicole is also responsible for designing an Africa focused strategy for identifying and addressing the needs of African investors with respect to integrating ESG, that's environmental, social and governance into investment processes. Zanele Mbuisa is the director and co-founder of Mbuisa Molele uh, Attorneys in Johannesburg, 100% black owned law firm with collective knowledge and experience of 20 years in human rights litigation and media law. And Zanele and Lee Day have worked together on cases for 22 years. Zanelli has been involved in several large and high profile cases against multinationals in South Africa together with Lee Day, including the groundbreaking Quebeca Trust, a silicosis settlement for more than 4,000 gold miners and the Cabway lead poisoning class action on behalf of Zambian communities. Now, um, just for, for everyone who's joined us, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the discussion. So I want to leave um, a significant amount of time at the end for that. You'll see a Q&A button uh, on your screen. And if you, if you uh, type your questions into that, they will be passed, uh, passed through to, to me and we'll try and make sure as many of them as possible are answered at the end. Now, before moving on to the discussion, we're gonna show you a two minute film about the tragic case of Cabway, described by The Guardian as the world's most toxic town. It's an example of a community that has been devastated by corporate negligence. So if we could just play that film, please. Over 230,000 people live in the lead contaminated town of Cabway, Zambia. This was home to the world's largest lead mine for 80 years and was part of the Anglo-American Mining Company Group from 1925 till 1974. There were serious deficiencies in control of lead emissions, which resulted in widespread contamination of the environment. The public health disaster that has entailed the poisoning of generations of children in the local communities was entirely predictable. When they left, as a result of their operations, they have left an environmental disaster. When you look at the clock study in the 1970 and the, the blood lead levels then, and to the blood levels now, nothing has changed. So the very same lead poisoning that was happening at that time is continuing happening now. Studies have shown that the soil in the township surrounding the mine has concentrations of lead more than 150 times higher than the relevant international standard of 400 milligrams per kilogram. Children are most at risk of lead poisoning because their brains and bodies 
are still developing. The younger you are, the greater the risk. When a child is exposed at, in those early years, they can live their whole lives long with, with a damaged heart, a damaged kidneys, and with impacts on the brain. And that cognitive loss is often permanent. Lead in the blood is absorbed into the bones. During pregnancy, this lead is released. It crosses the placenta, causing harm to the unborn child. This is a serious risk for all girls and women of childbearing age in Kabwe. There is no safe level of lead in the body. Mental impairment can occur at levels as low as 5 micrograms per deciliter. Treatment is required at 45 micrograms per deciliter. Levels in excess of 100 micrograms per deciliter can be fatal. Various studies have shown that in some areas of Kabwe, all children under seven have been found to have levels above five micrograms per deciliter. Around 50% have levels greater than 45 micrograms per deciliter, and many have levels above 100 micrograms per deciliter. At those levels, you could expect to see convulsions, coma, permanent muscular paralysis, and that child could die. Anglo today subscribes to human rights principles. Unfortunately, Anglo's practices in Kabwe seem totally at odds with its public commitments. Hey, thank you. Um, well, before we move to the discussion, I should just say that Anglo denies liability for the in, in the Cabway case. In a statement, they said that in the early 1970s, the company that owned the mine was nationalized by the government of Zambia. And for more than 20 years thereafter, the mine was operated by a state owned body until its closure in 1994. Uh, furthermore, Anglo said it would take all necessary steps to vigorously defend its position. Okay. Uh, Zanella, you're representing the victims in this case. You've been to Cabway on many occasions. Uh, how would you describe the predicament of the communities? You're on mute. You need to unmute, Zanella. I'm on mute. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Richard. So Cabway is a poor community uh, that has been suffering from lead contamination for decades. It is a community whose children and pregnant women suffer the most because of the contamination. The parents of the children are, wor are worried um, about the well-being of their children and the effects the lead contamination has on their, their children. They know that their children have high blood levels, lead levels, and it is making them sick and causing co uh, behavioral and cognitive uh, problems. They know that the source of the lead contamination is from the mine and has been all along from the mine. Community leaders over the years have been trying to get help to deal with this problem. They've been going to everybody trying to get assistance to deal with this problem until they found us. Their parents tell us that every now and then some organization or maybe a government organization that I'm sure would come and test their children, find that they have high lead levels in their blood and they will give them tonic and some soybeans and milk. And this will go on for a couple of months and stop. And no one will tell them why it's stopping. They don't know whether it's helping or not. They're just in the dark. But the one thing that they're consistent uh, about is the fact that the lead contamination is a result of the mining operations that are in Kabul. It's a very dire situation. It is a horrible situation for young women who are contemplating or will have children in the future as the video has shown that lead um, sits in the body and slowly leaches out uh, of the bones and that affects the children in vitro. So as it stands, the situation in cover is quite dire and the community is doing their best to try and deal with the situation, try and do right by their children, parents taking care of their children. They cannot move. I don't think they can even afford to move. Yeah, it's a total scandal. There's no way that that kind of situation would be tolerated over here. It's absolutely shocking. Um, Malaya, now you're, um, you're wearing two hats today because as well as being the Amnesty International 
representative. You also grew up in Cabway. Can you tell us um, your recollection of, of your experiences? Uh, thanks, Richard. And um, just as Anelia has said, um, yes, I did grow up in Cabwe, and uh, in, in many ways, it's still a, a one horse town. Uh, nothing much has changed from when I was uh, um, growing up there um, and, and, and what it looks like now. Um, and, you know, this is the oldest mine in, in, in Zambia, and it was run by the uh, British South African Company. Uh, discovered by an Australian called uh, T.J. Davey. Um, well, we were told by history books that it was discovered by an Australian, just like the Victoria Falls were discovered by David Livingston in an area where my father's ancestors grew up uh, in Livingston. David Living uh, in Livingston, David Livingston from Scotland came and discovered where my ancestors um, had always lived. Uh, so uh, it's 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 literally the same. So there there were two my, there were two industries. It was the railways and the mining and the railway was built by the roads uh, company, the BSA company, in order to transport the lead and zinc. So the, the carbon mine actually mined lead and zinc, uh, which was then transported for use uh, in um, uh, industries in, in Europe post the industrial revolution um, and further. Um, and so the railway tracks really divided people in, in, in Cowboy. So if you lived on the other part of the tracks, um, at least after independence and at the time I was growing up, then your outcomes were very different from if you lived on the other side of the tracks where the mine dumps and the mines um, are, were. And so um, when we were growing up and going to school, um, because there were no schools, uh, remember that the colonialists had not, there were no schools in the mining areas. Uh, where uh, migrant workers from different parts of the country had moved in in order to pay poll tax uh, so that they could afford to pay poll tax, which poll tax was then used to build the railways for uh, the BSA company. So it was almost like being taxed twice um, just to earn a living. Um, so in, in the end, I mean, we had uh, uh, two kids, uh, we had children that came uh, to our schools and most of the times their outcomes were very, very low. Um, they looked smaller and their, their education outcomes were very, very low. Mm. Yeah. David, I don't know what, um, what, um, uh, what you think about this, um, this situation and watching this video and whether it's surprised you. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it, it, it hasn't. Uh, and I think it's part of a, a longer historical trajectory that I know we're going to talk about um, about later. I mean, I've been traveling around, I'm from West Africa, but I've been traveling around Southern Africa um, for about uh, 20 years making historical programs um, because there is an appetite for looking at the longer history um, of that part of the world, but not looking at um, its current predicament and the role of multinational companies um, in Southern Africa or in any in any part of Africa. But as an historian, when I when I read and when I watch about the abuses of multinational companies, it, I guess I see the continuities. Um, Malaya mentioned uh, earlier the the, um, the British South Africa Company, the BSA. Empire was about companies. It was built by companies, particularly in Southern Africa, but also in West Africa, the East India Company. This was a, an empire. Um, the British Empire was not unique in any way about this. It was, it was built about companies and it was built on, on, a, on a fundamental idea. And I think that that's the sort of thing that's been, that's passed on between the 19th century and, 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 uh, and the 21st. Uh, I mean, Joseph Conrad, the great writer, um, of, of empire. He, he was in some ways very frank, uh, in some ways not so, about empire, but he described in Heart of Darkness, he described empire as just robbery and violence, aggravated murder on a great scale. But he believed that it was redeemed, or his characters, at least he gave voice to the idea that it was redeemed by an idea. Um, and that this was, a, was, a, was a, a great, great and powerful idea, uh, an idea that he said that you could sort of bow down before. And I think this idea at its heart was, was the idea that there were two, two worlds. And we talk about first world, second world, third world, though increasingly I'm glad to see we don't. But the idea that part of the world exists under the writ of law and other parts of the world do not. And I think that idea enshrined into empire, that there are parts of the world where the law is real and there are parts of the world where the law is just an idea. 
uh, or does not exist at all. I think that's fundamental to understanding. This is this is how uh, empire built. It's how totalitarian regimes um, are built. If you think about the great crimes of the Second World War, they were mainly committed by taking people away from zones where there was law. The Jews of Germany were not exterminated in Germany. They were taken into a military zone where there was no where there was no law. The the laws of um, of uh, of warfare that were codified in the early um, 20th, well, late 19th, early 20th century with the great Hague Conventions. There was, they existed within the behavior between Europeans, but there was an understanding that they did not exist when Europeans were fighting um, outside of Europe and the West. So this idea of a place where law is real and a place where law is merely lip service, that's the big idea that contaminated the 21st century and that did not end with the formal end of, um, of nation state empires. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, yeah, David, that's a good um, kind of segue into the, into the first question I've got to ask. And, and, and you've, you've partially answered it there, which um, was um, why this kind of conduct that um, we've seen in, in some of these cases was a considered acceptable by the companies in question and and why why it was or how it was allowed to happen um now i mean you you've um you've ex, you've explained that that partially but what about the mindset of, of the companies how could i mean these the company directors they they've got they've got children um they presumably wouldn't dream of uh uh, uh, exposing their own children to these risks. What what what's was going on here? Did they some did they think that these children were not as valuable, or these people were not as valuable as as people where they came from? What what is it all about? What underpins this attitude? I would say again, it is a schizophrenia that is based on on empire. The ideas of empire were, were built up over centuries. They didn't emerge. They were they evolved, and then they were propagandized, and then they were inbuilt into culture. They were passed down from generation to generation through uh, through literature, through science, through popular culture, and they were hardwired into the way the West thinks. And this this double think is really common. I'm talking to you today from the city of Bristol, which made itself uh, more famous globally last year than it probably has been since the 18th century by toppling a statue of Edward Colston. And the reason why that's divided this city is because two things at the same time are true of Edward Colston. It is absolutely true that he was the second greatest, though the first is forgotten, um, philanthropist in the history of this city. He built an arms house, he built a hospital, he built schools. He used not the majority, but a, a very large proportion of his wealth to create institutions that were there for the betterment of poor uh, people in Bristol. I should say only if they were of his high Tory um, Anglican denomination. He was not happy about this money going to Catholic children or Quaker children. But this was about philanthropy. He was absolutely serious in his concern about the homelessness and the poverty that he saw in Bristol. And yet he, there's no evidence in what little writing of his we have left of any sense of the fact that he was involved in his time as deputy governor and shareholder in the uh, Royal African Company, again, a company, a private enterprise with, with state, and I'm afraid in this case, literally royal backing. There's no evidence that he ever thought about the children um, who were put on Royal African Company ships, who were kept in Royal Africa Company fortresses on the coast of West Africa, and who, if they survived the Middle Passage, were worked to death on the plantations of the New World. At the time he was part of the Royal Africa Company, they were debating at what age below would they not brand with a metal brand, the letters RAC, into Africans. And they decided that uh, nine was the appropriate age in which children could be could have letters burnt into their chest with a metal brand that would be normally used on cattle. So and we're talking about someone who died literally 300 years ago. He died in 1721. And that schizophrenia, that capacity for doublethink, that capacity be, to be a philanthropist and a mass killer is there from the start. And this, this, this mindset is part of what created the modern world. And this schizophrenia is obviously underpinned by a very strong sense of racism. It is. I mean, this, this, this is the, this is the other other um, 
reality. But I have to say, I mean, you, you see examples, and you will know better than I do, you see examples of absolutely appalling uh, human rights abuses com committed by companies in where there is no racial difference. You know, the history of the Soviet Union is of uh, a, a central party being willing to uh, commit the lives of hundreds of thousands of their fellow citizens uh, to work in, in toxic plants producing uranium. Uh, I mean, the, the, the gulag is, I mean, the, people forget that the gulag was a work system. It produced uranium and gold at huge human costs. So, you know, race, criminality, ideology, they, they can all act in this function. But, but, you know, race, we underestimate how powerful a race, an idea of race is, and we underestimate the fact that it was constructed. I mean, when people complain, as they often do, about the phrase structural racism, I mean, what the historian would argue is that it's structural because it was deliberately constructed. It was created, and it was created because it had to do an incredibly powerful idea. It had to convince people at the sharp end of these enterprises, slavery, empire, colonial genocide, that the people that they were dealing with, the people that they were enslaving or branding or punishing or killing were not human beings. And to convince a human being that a, that a man, a woman, or a child in front of them is not a human being and they do not matter. You need something very powerful. And those are, that idea is race, but the idea of race is always, always um, buttressed with law. The history of slavery is a history of laws. The history of empire is the history of treaties that had legal weight. So the law is always there. It is about taking uh, the law and using it not to support rights, but to take rights away, not to give people hum human humanity and human dignity, but to strip them of it. Mm. And, and Zanella, I mean, talking about structural racism in the law, you were involved, um, you represented the silicosis victims, for more than 4,000 silicosis victims who'd worked on the gold mines uh, in, a, in, a, in the long running litigation against Anglo-American and Anglo-Gold. And do you think, uh, I mean, what, what, um, what do you want to add um, when you consider that case and about the similarities between that and, and the situation at Cabway and, and with Cape PLC? Well, the one underpinning thing um, on the cases that we've done in the past is the treatment of the mining companies of their workers who are doing the hard work. Well, first, the black, the ones that are doing the hard work, the ones that are facing the adverse effect of, get, of getting sick or any mind related illness. For instance, um, silicosis was known to be dangerous as early as 1912, correct? So instead of actually dealing with something and giving workers proper protective gear to, pr to help uh, to prevent them from getting sick, what did the mining companies do? They, together with the government of the time, created a compensation scheme because they somehow estimated that a certain percentage of the mine workers will get ill. And so, so that percentage had to be compensated also to protect the mining companies from being sued. So if you claim from the compensation scheme, you would not go and sue the mining companies if, even if you, you, you could as a black uh, worker. The result of that, you had a compensation scheme. The mining companies contributed to the scheme. They also had to do their part and do the examinations and the x-rays and send them to the compensation bureau so that these miners can get uh, compensated. But they didn't even bother to do that with their black workers. The compensation scheme here in Johannesburg for white workers, mine workers, worked fine. They got compensated on time. They got their x-rays reviewed. The quality of the x-rays that they got was really good. The quality of x-rays for the black mine workers, if they even got the x-rays, was poor. And when the mining companies were supposed to send the exit and the examination, periodical examination x-rays to the bureau, the medical bureau, they didn't even bother to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Since the time when they decided to create this, um, this scheme, they didn't even bother to do studies to see the continued effect of these illnesses on the, on, on the miners and the ex-mine workers. So the one underlining thing is this, they didn't care about the black worker. It wasn't their problem. Um, to an extent that the bureau, it was only after apartheid ended that black workers were allowed or ex-mine workers were allowed to go to the bureau to have the examination. The bureau operates like an, a hospital. 
it had a lung function section, it had good quality x-rays. All along, these ex-mine workers did not have access to that. Some of them weren't even home, not even knowing that they are sick. That is the way mining companies view black people, mm. which is disdain. Nicole, um, if I just bring you in, um, I mean, we've heard about the, the kind of the, the context in which this was happening, but from the perspective of the mining companies and their investors, I mean, was it just a question of um, not caring, but actually being focused on making a fast buck? So I think that's a good question, and I'd, I'd like to assume not, um, especially in the case of institutional investors that are looking at much longer time horizons. But I think it goes back to a point that's an element about it not being your problem. And I think one of the things that's happened in the recent past is the evolution of the thinking of the role of investors and the responsibility of investors. What is important to understand is that the protection of human rights, while we consider it something that should be intuitive, um, it's not something that's often codified in the investment process. Um, it might form part of a due diligence, but it's not something that's explicit usually. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from this underpinning of human rights being uh, divided into sort of two main camps in the sense that there's a state duty to protect and that there's a corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And there wasn't an explicit guidance for investors until as late as uh, 2013, which is the first time that the United Nations guiding principles were clarified to apply specifically to institutional investors. And guidance specifically from the OECD for investors on the protection of human rights only came into effect in, in 2017, which is very recent. And this is not excusing anyone, but it's to, to David's point as well about how the system was not structured in a way that gave investors any responsibility in this. Their responsibility has always been understood to, to be to maximize shareholder value until recently when we started thinking about stakeholder value and the role of investors in the, the broader role that they have in, uh, in creating sort of general economic and environmental and socioeconomic stability. Um, but that's really, really, really recent development. Until then, the role of the investor was not seen to be worrying about this. It was, you make sure there's no massive red flag that's going to render this investment to be not a going concern. Um, and everything else is up to the management of the company and the state needs to protect sort of the legal rights. And I think, um, thank God, there's been an evolution in that thinking and there's an understanding now that the influence and the leverage that these investors have in a, it equips them with a sort of power uh, and with that comes a responsibility to to take these things into account and that is changing very slowly but it is changing but it's very recent regrettably but back then what you're saying is that they were quite happy to turn a blind eye to it because no one had specifically told them yeah um, I, and I, i'm not sure if it was a you know a malice it was really just a this is not my role this is not what's something i'm supposed to worry about um, somebody else has definitely got to do that. But I do think there would have been people that saw it and turned a blind eye, and there would have been people who just never even thought to look. You say it's not malice, but isn't it malicious to be making money in that way? I'm not sure. I think um, I think it's always, there's always, you know, from an investment trade-off and from any sort of economic development trade-off, people will always be able to argue with you that they are, there's always trade-offs. And if uh, from an investment standpoint, if you don't look at that next layer, you're not aware that that's the cost. Um, so I think it's two things, right? It's one thing to just never look and just be sort of blindly ignorant. It's another to look and condone. Um, and I suppose that's two different kinds of people, two different you're, kinds you're, of investment institutions. You're distinguishing there between the investors and the, and the companies, the operating companies themselves, because... The yeah, so I, yeah, that, they knew what was happening. Yeah, I, yeah, they definitely knew. Um, and I suppose everyone has some responsibility in that because the companies would have been expected to report to their investors on what the investors deemed important. And if no investor ever asked them about that, um, that's the failing of the investor. But if the company never thought to bring it up, that's their failing. So I think everybody's been flawed, highly flawed, uh, and continues to be. It's a work in progress, I think, like I said. You know, even the, now in the pandemic, this sort of uh, experience has really shone a light on just how poorly we as investors handle the S in the ESG. Um, and uh, like I said, you'd think it intuitive that 
you know, when you talk to him, there's no one who will blatantly say to, you know, I don't really care about human rights. I think it's to David's point about what you, who you consider human um, as well is a big part of that. But when you ask investors, okay, but what is your policy? What is your approach to this? Is it codified in the way that you make investments, in the way that you delegate, uh, you know, delegate investment mandates? And they'll say no. And that's where the problem is, is again, to David's point, that if it's not institutionalized, um, it's very easy to forget about it. Okay, well, we'll come on to the, the current position in a while. Um, the, the next question that I raised at the in the introduction was um, uh, whether this lack of regard for fellow human beings that we've seen in these cases is just a thing of the colonial past or is still ongoing. I mean, Malaya, uh, I mean, have, have these businesses just what walked off scot-free, leaving a, a legacy, a toxic legacy of environmental devastation? Now, you've been involved in in campaigns mm -hmm. in other cases, including the Lonmin platinum mine where the Maracana mm -hmm. massacre occurred a few years ago. I and mean, perhaps you, you could mm -hmm. give us just a brief, a very brief summary of that situation and whether you think it's really parallels with, with Cabway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that, uh, you know, just to Nicole's point, the, the colonial legacy is still with us now. Uh, we can't run away from that. And it was very, it was based on capitalistic uh, sort of aspirations of just extracting, making money and, you know, shipping it out. So if you look at um, a lot of the, uh, the way the industries have performed or developed in Zambia, the mining industry, um, it was about extracting the, uh, the ore, if it was, it was the copper ore, or the lead and zinc, putting it on the railway, and off they went uh, with, with everything. And there was no care for the black workers. Like Zanele said earlier, uh, there was nothing that was accruing to them apart from them working in order to pay core tax so that they can work and pay more core tax. So with the loan mean situation, that's uh, um, uh, a, a sort of... Um, mentality continued or the legacy continued because it's all grounded in discrimination and racism as far as I'm concerned uh, because there was no real respect for the black workers. So on the 16th of August, just to give a summary, the South African police uh, fatally shot 34 people at Marikana in the northwest of the country. And these men were employees of Lonmin, which is London Minerals, and had been engaged in um, a strike and protest, protest action over pay and poor working conditions. Um, the, the killings as well as the growing unrest across the mining uh, uh, sector sparked a national crisis and even a global uh, crisis. I was watching it on television when it was happening live when people were being shot by the police. Now, if you go to Marikana, it's a, um, the, the mine itself uh, is um, in a place, there's a settlement there called Nkaneng and Kaneng housed most of the mine workers who were brutally shot by the, uh, the police, uh, ostensibly on orders from the police in cahoots with the mine owners because they wanted them to disperse from the copy of, from the hill that they had been sitting on. Um, now, uh, the, the, the conditions in the settlement are bleak. Uh, it comprises thousands of shacks constructed mainly from metal sheets and bits of wood. These structures are crowded together, surrounded by litter, and when it rains uh, by mud, they have uh, doors, but they're, you know, very, very uh, few have any proper windows, if any, and in winter, the shacks are extremely cold. During the rainy season, they leak and they suffer a lot of damage. Um, so yes, there are parallels to the cover situation, because uh, when you drive to Marikana, you know, you're, you're greeted with the same disused mine shafts and dump, just like in Kawe. And when you get to the, uh, close to the mine, there are many shafts. Uh, I remember feeling sick when um, interviewing one woman whose husband had been killed of the 34 miners there, and she had a three-year-old baby. Her shack was made of plastic bags. This is a mine that is declaring profits every year hundreds of millions of profits, but there was a woman who lives in a shack whose husband was a rock, um, uh, a rock um, a driller 
within uh, Lonmen that was living in conditions like that. And at the time he died, she informed us that he was very sick because of being underground for so long. He had chest problems. He had contracted TB at the time, but he was shot anyway uh, during, um, during Marikana. So there's no respect for things like um, social labor plans. So they know that they should have social labor, that they should adhere to the social labor plans. Um, but uh, there was no respect for so social labor plans. So Marikana, long in mind, had said they were going to uh, build 5,000 housing settlements for their workers because they lived in appalling conditions. At the time we went to do the research, there were only three show houses out there. So it shows you that the disdain that they have, like, like Zanella said, for black people, but also the fact that the government has no capacity to monitor um, their uh, uh, compliance with uh, SLPs that are imposed uh, through uh, legislation. Well, Zanelli, I think um, with that, you can identify with that last point about the lack of uh, regulation and enforcement of regulations enabling the, the companies to get away with it. And um, also difficulties in people uh, who are affected being able to get access to justice is a real issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally can. So the effect that I've seen uh, when we do this case is that when government um, is incapable of enforcing regulations, um, the end product of that is that government ends up burdened with a much bigger problem uh, than they had before. Again, going back to the compensation scheme, right? If the mining companies had done their part by sending all those x-rays and doing the proper thing, people would have been compensated. And if the wages were better, people have, would have gotten better compensation. But then the, the issue, the situation when, I'll give you an example, in 1987, and in the mining, in, in the gold mines, there was this big strike where all the uh, gold mine workers went on this massive strike because they were fighting for their rights because the working conditions were appalling. The end result was that, Anglo-American alone fired um, about 90,000 of those workers. They just put them back into the buses and sent them back to the Eastern Cape. They didn't give them their benefits. They didn't give them the, the medical uh, exit that they would need to claim compensation in the future. So now you had these hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of ex-mine workers who are unemployed. And when they get home, they start getting sick, but they don't even know why they're sick, right? Initially, they think they have TB and they should get medication to get sick. They don't realize they have an, an uncurable uh, illness. So they're sitting there with no money coming in, no income, no way to make income because they're too sick to do that. So this becomes a bigger problem for who? For the government because the scheme is run through the Department of Health. So now government has to make sure that they put hospitals that have occupational units. That's money that mining companies are not contributing to. They're sitting pretty. They've abused the, the one resource that is most valuable, the human resource of the country. And now we, the public, and uh, we have to use our purses to try and clean up their mess or deal with their messes. David, I think you've um, you sort of indicated an affirmative response to this earlier, but um, you know, with the kind of conduct that we've um, just been hearing about and um, with profits from the company's uh, operations flowing back to the home country. Is this, um, you know, are, are what is what is happening here effectively multinationals taking over um, the, the role and, and behavior of the, the, the previous colonizers? I would argue it entirely is. These systems were created as imperial systems. I mean, Cabway was laid out in the early 20th century, the decision to have the uh, the black workers lived downstream, downwind um, of the of the lead works was was hardwired um, into the planning of that of that site. I think one of the things that both colonial governments and today's multinationals have have going for them is that they're able to to harvest an incredible amount of disbelief when you actually tell people about what happened in the nineteenth and twentieth centuries in European empires. They will not believe you. And I'm sure from your work, you know, when you show people that companies that you may have heard of, that maybe you, your pension may be invested in, are doing these things, people will not believe you. Uh, uh, last week or the week before last, um, the company that I run, television company, we um, uh, we'd made a program about the the way that the British 
Commonwealth War Graves Commission had abandoned around a third of a million uh, African carriers and soldiers in the First World War um, who had died fighting for Britain and who hadn't been given equal treatment. Um, they had they'd not been given headstones. Their bodies are left in East Africa from Mozambique all the way up um, to, to Kenya. Um, a third of a million people who fought in the war for Britain were not treated to the extent that bodies were exhumed, their skulls were measured. If they were white, they were given a headstone. Here lies a soldier of the Great War. If they were black, they were literally put back in the mass grave. And I've spent two weeks getting letters and social media tweets of people who, who genuinely cannot believe. They cannot believe me and they need to attack me or attack my evidence, even when the government and the organization in, in, response, in responsible writes a report, admits to these things, and publicly apologizes. The Minister of Defense apologized in Parliament, and yet there are still thousands of people who just will not believe this. And this is one of the, 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 the things that was always priced into empire, was that people wouldn't believe how rapacious it was. The poll tax system that Malaya described, the hot tax before that, it was a deliberate system to take people who were pastoralists and force them to become a compliant, cheap labor system. When the Gold mines at De Beers Farm, and then later the um, the, the 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 so the diamond mines at De Beers and the gold reserves were found at the Witterstein. The economic planning for this, carried out by uh, by Cecil Rhodes, who still remember memorialized in this country as a hero, it hardwired into it the idea of a cheap, usable, di disposable workforce. This is the way capitalism has been designed and it's not just the 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 the, the empire there's uh, when i drive around london across london there are social housing projects in the 19th century the peabody trust there's lots of artisan dwelling companies and they're beautiful red brick buildings they were built to try to get people out of the slums and what the the philanthropists Peabody and others discovered when they built them is the people in the slums could never afford that social housing, because there was a proportion of the, of the economy that did not pay a living wage, would not pay a living wage, and accepted, the whole society accepted that a certain percentage of people were living below in the abyss, below the poverty line. When you add distance and race and empire and ideology to this, it becomes deadly. It becomes absolutely toxic, literally toxic in the cases um, of the places that, that, we're, that we're describing. But that was hardwired into the forms of capitalism that developed in the 18th and 19th centuries in the imperial world and even in the metropole. Uh, so I think we can certainly identify with uh, your comment about um, people not wanting to believe um, uh, bad things about, especially about iconic companies. Um, that um, certainly reflects our experience. Um, Zanelli, just still on this point about um, whether these abuses are still ongoing, uh, what, what's your experience of the manner in which these companies defend cases? I mean, they're obviously entitled to defend, def defend a case if they, if they don't think they're liable. I mean, they're, they're perfectly entitled to do that. But, I mean, do you have any concerns about the way these cases tend to be defended? Yeah, um, the one thing that I always wonder about is that, it, first of all, them denying liability, they know their mind there, right? It's not like we're bringing something new, like, hey, did you know that you mind it? They know that they mind it. They know, they know how they treated their workers, but they will defend it with all their might, right? First, they have the money to do that. And yes, they do have the right to do that. But they then will hire the big law firm, the big companies, and who will delay the cases on procedural grounds, right? In South Africa, we have a system where, um, uh, when, you know, the, if, if, a, if a, 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 a claimant or a complainant dies before pleadings are closed, uh, the other side is pleaded, the claim dies with them. So their family or their wife cannot carry on with the claim. So usually before they plead, they will hold you up on procedure for a longest time, right? And delaying the process. And during that time, a lot of the clients uh, pass away. We've seen it in silicosis. Mm -hmm. Silicosis, the first, the first case of silicosis that we did took about what, 10 years? Mm 
Mm-hmm. And in that process, it, you know, we not, we lost a number of those of those clients. In the second phase as well, uh, second case of so it was the same thing. Um, so the plan is for them to del- to delay. Also, what we've seen um, recently in South Africa is the introduction by um, mining companies of the slap lawsuits. You know, these lawsuits, these lawsuits that they they bring to stop uh, activists or law firms from suing them. And fortunately, in a recent judgment in South Africa, the judge saw it for what it was as intimidation. And that judgment is very clear in its decision to, 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 to stop that in its track. But this continues. There's a place in Eastern Cape called Kolobeni. Uh, I don't know if anyone has heard of it, uh, with an Austrian mining company. This has divided commu- uh, communi- the community. The mining company, has weaponized people's hunger and unemployment and poverty to sow division in the community to an extent that the activists that are anti the mining uh, 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 mining there have been killed. There have been assassinations and they're the ones as well with the, with, with the slap lawsuit. It is incredible to me that instead of actually acknowledging and not paying lip service and saying, oh yeah, we acknowledge that we've done wrong in the past, uh, and, and actively find a solution in dealing with this and giving justice to people, they will fight to the bitter end. They'd rather pay lawyers millions than deal with the issue. Well, and as you say, with the gold mines and silicosis, I mean, how many thousands or tens of thousands of yeah. them died before the, the cases would have got to the stage of uh, the settlement schemes that were totally. established? And you totally. remember the Cape PLC case that, that, I mean, you were also involved in that with us many years ago a thousand of our seven and a half thousand clients died yeah. during the course of exactly it. while we're fighting the case and you know what it is as well the the, the lawyers it, it is such a a brazen way they fight because they, they will throw everything at you including even not taking the lawyers personally but they will throw everything at it and they just don't care about the one thing that matters the one thing that brought us to this court the claimants mm. Now, you mentioned the phrase lip service, which brings us to the third topic, which is the grand um, human rights pronouncements by businesses and whether they reflect a genuine commitment to human rights or are they just paying lip service? Now, um, Nicole, when you um, you mentioned earlier that um, companies have only, this is only the need to consider uh, stakeholders other than shareholders is something that's only really registered recently. In fact, back in the 1950s, here's a quote from Anglo-Americans chairman, Sir Ernest Oppenheimer. He said in the 1950s, the aim of this group is and will remain to earn profits for our shareholders, but to do so in such a way as to make a real and lasting contribution to the communities in which we operate. Their current human rights policy today states that where we have caused or contributed to adverse human rights impacts, we will contribute to their remediation as appropriate. So that's the question is, are they just paying lip service, companies generally, when they make these pronouncements? And um, what incentives and and pressures do businesses uh, have to prevent human rights abuses or, or environmental damage? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, a good question. And uh, I, I don't work with the issuers themselves, but from the investor perspective, at least, the role of the a responsible investor at this stage is to in- interrogate that and not to ask, you know, is the appropriate policy in place or only is the appropriate policy in place, but is it being implemented? Um, to Zanelle's point about, you know, rules and regulations mean nothing if you're not going to enforce them. And it's the same in the company level. Right. If you've got these policies in place, but nobody's actually enforcing them, it's pointless. And from an investor standpoint, it's not good enough. It might have been, uh, you know, from where we're coming from, but it's no longer good enough to say, oh, but they've got the policy and it's on their website. And there's this great quote from the CEO um, or my favorite. There's this amazing picture of the CEO holding, you know, a poor black child. And so obviously they're doing great things. Um, I see Malaya's laughing there because you're talking about every annual report you've ever seen. Um, but yeah, it's I think there's a growing recognition and at least from the PRI side, 
and what we expect from our signatories, that that's no longer good enough. And what we're asking them for is a lot more accountability on this, including incorporating human rights um, into our reporting and assessment framework for our signatories, working with policymakers and regulators on creative uh, on uh, creating conducive environments in terms of policy and regulation. We're working on industry level engagements where we know that there are troubling in, in industries and working with investors on engaging with one another in a collaborative way so that we can affect real change and getting the right data, because do you have a policy, yes or no, is not, not enough anymore. So we need to really understand what is it that we need to be looking at, and as an investor, how are you making sure that that's the case? And in terms of your the second part of your question, in terms of the incentives, I mean, at least from an investor standpoint, there's been a growing understanding over the last few years, and really accelerated, I'd say, in the last three to five years, that investors are not investing in a vacuum. And when we used to think about environmental, social and governance issues, it was always as a risk mitigant. It was what is what environmental, social governance issues present a red flag for my investment, for this particular asset or for this portfolio in general. And that thinking has evolved to a much more systemic view, thinking about not just which ESG factors impact my investments, what is the impact of my investment decisions on broader socioeconomic environments, environmental stability, and how does that in turn affect the ability of my portfolio to generate return. So you've heard this, you know, you probably heard this expression about how there are no returns on a dead planet. And that's why a lot of investors are starting to take climate more seriously. The same logic applies to there are no returns to be gained from operations that are trying to exist in communities that have descended into chaos because of poorly managed social issues. And so as an investor, it is 100% in your interest to understand these, these issues, to identify the problems and to work at actually addressing them. Um, and uh, I think that understanding is growing and it's being thankfully starting to be supported by policy and regulation as well, which helps for capital markets. You know, there's always going to be first movers that sort of lead the way and there's going to be those that only do it out of compliance. Um, and my argument is that I don't really mind why you do it as long as you do it. So if you're doing it just because you it's the law, then great. Then we need to make sure that for the, that group, the law is setting the bar a bit higher. And then for those that are doing it actually because they understand the sort of ethical understanding and the moral impetus to do that and there's a broader humanity that's lacking in their approach, um, for them, there's the, the sort of leading group. I mean, it's but it's good, happening slowly. I mean, it's good to hear that um, certain investors are becoming more proactive about this. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you think about mining companies, you wonder how... Um, as 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 companies, how committed they are to all this. I mean, you know, they're not companies like H and M and Nike who deal directly with consumers who are worried about their their public image so much, are they? I mean, does a mining company really care how bad it looks? Well, I can't speak for mining companies. I'd say based on the experience we have so far, it doesn't seem so, does it? Um, but I I do think that. One of the things that's important to understand around mining, and I'm not a mining expert, um, so I'll just caveat with that, but that is that um, mining is something that will be around for a long time, because even when we think about our transition to low carbon economies, mining is an important part of that as well, of that process and of you know, the products and the services that we need for that. And so it's going to be, I think, under, as are all industries, ever closer scrutiny about how is it contributing as opposed to just what is it extracting? Um, and I, I like to think that the mining companies are gonna to have to start to answer to that because especially the ones that are trying to transition and that still wanna be in business in 2050 and are looking at different ways of, of remaining relevant. This is one of the ways they can differentiate themselves. Well, Leia, how, how um, convinced are, um, are you at Amnesty with, uh, with all these, um corporate pronouncements. You're on mute, sorry. Are you there? Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in our experience, we found that mostly um, companies do not uh, adhere to minerals development or environmental or any other laws related to social labor plans, for example. 
Um, and like I said earlier, the regulatory environment is quite lenient to mine operations because there's this need for um, governments to balance development or what they call the public interest, whatever that may be in this case, with um, the operations of, uh, of, of, of mining companies. So for example, I'll give you a, a, a case you might know, Richard, it's uh, uh, Nyasulu versus the Environmental Council of Zambia um, a while back, in which the judge literally found that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the mine company in Concola had uh, deposited effluent um, uh, from its pipes and that effluent had caused a number of diseases uh, on the people that are living uh, around the Kafua River. But uh, even though he found that, what he then ordered was compensation, uh, a slight compensation to the people there. However, he also said that the mining operations should continue and that there shouldn't be any um, uh, sanction on the Environmental Council of Zambia as it then was. Uh, because they were politically powerful people that that company was dealing with. So political consideration came into, into light. So there's always this toxic behavior between government sometimes and politics and, um, uh, and, and, mining, and mining companies. And um, uh, companies also think that they can just circumvent uh, the law because the laws are usually there, but they're just not implemented. So what they do is that they can uh, do small uh, CSR project um, and that those CSR project equal the amount of damage that they do to the environment um, and the intergenerational poverty they contribute to in those uh, areas. So for example, funding a football team here and there, installing a poor, um, poorly stocked clinic most of the time there. And they're not called um, to look at sustainable ways uh, to do mining. Well, which benefits uh, both them and the community. So the profit motive usually then trumps people and the environment. Um, and um, if at all, there would be no one left to mine and enjoy the money they make, uh, they will still continue doing that, uh, even if it's uh, to their own detriment. So making profit. Now the failure by governments themselves to ensure that business enterprises is, um, performing such services operate in a manner consistent with the uh, with government's human rights um, obligations may entail both reputational and uh, legal consequences for the government itself. So I think that as a necessary step, the relevant service contracts or enabling legislation should clarify the state's expectations that these enterprises respect human rights, but the states should also ensure that they can effectively oversee the enterprise's activities, including though, uh, through the provision of adequate independent monitoring and accountability uh, uh, mechanisms. Just a quick one that when we were doing the research on uh, Marikana, there was one person that was looking at 200 uh, social labor plans. And in some cases, these labor plans are 200 pages. Um, you know, so how can you have a person looking at 200 of them and you expect that they'll have the capacity to monitor what these companies are doing? So a lot of times they get away with it because they know that the environment allows for that to happen. So true, yes, thanks. I'm just um, changing the, or moving on really onto the, onto the next, topic that uh, was in my list was um, the question about whether the, the public in the global north is really that interested in corporate mistreatment of communities in Africa. Now, um, recently, uh, you will have seen um, what happened, or you may have read about what happened with um, the communities in Kenya around the plantations that are owned by a British company, Camellia, who were growing uh, avocados amongst other things and supplying UK supermarkets. And this was the subject of an expose in the Sunday Times with the result that the UK supermarkets suspended purchases of avocados uh, from this company. But um, I mean, if there isn't a clear UK connection um, the impression seems to be that the mainstream media and society seem generally disinterested in human rights issues located in Africa. Um, David, what, what do you think about that? I saw, you, you mentioned earlier that there was an appetite for documentaries, but I mean, would you agree with what I've said there, or is that um, too pessimistic? Uh, 
No, I, I think it's depressingly accurate. And I think there's an, there's an appetite for, for documentaries about, um, about history. Um, I think we're far more interested in the First World War than we were than we are about any current conflict. Uh, I think we were much more comfortable with the past than we are with the present. But I mean, here, I mean, I speak about television more than newspapers. I, I work for The Guardian, who I think has probably got the best record in covering global um, justice issues. But I spend the most of my time working in television. And TV has a culture. It has its own internal, um, like all industries it has its own you know, micro internal subculture and within that culture has developed ideas um, that I think mitigate mitigate against the coverage of these issues some of them are about the audience and some of them are about the about the attitude to people in television television has a capacity in its internal culture to take words and make them into, into pejoratives and the worst word that can be applied about a project in its early early stages um, before it's been commissioned is worthy if a project is deemed to be worthy, if your colleague says that about your project, it's an insult and they're, they're trying to insult you and tell you you're naive. If a commissioner uses that about your project, what they're saying is it's not going to get commissioned. And what people will talk about is, well, people struggle with things that aren't about Britain, that we struggle with it with programs, programs that have subtitles, for example, don't get um, don't get uh, viewers. People will say, well, television is about escapism, not about confronting realities and there's some truth in that and we know the audience drop off for example i remember many years ago channel for news uh speaking to somebody there told me that if they at the end of part three if they at the at the conclusion of part three say in coming up in part four it's a story about uh africa and about human rights abuses uh, they know that, that you know a proportion of their audience turns off because they don't they, they don't want to know i think the positive news is i think this is changing in a generational way um, I think the anti-intellectualism of television, the culture of frivolousness and unseriousness that emerged in television from the 1990s, that was absolutely there in the 70s and the 80s, the heyday of panorama and world in action in the United Kingdom that became the model for programs made all over the world. I think that that age of unseriousness is coming to an end because, because younger people, people in their 20s and the millennial generation are far, far more interested in these issues they're far more globally aware they're far more interconnected because of the internet they're far more diverse in the united kingdom because their friends and their their uh, social groups come from all over the world but i think something else as as is is happening is um television is changing because it's not just the terrestrial channels anymore i think netflix have done something really really interesting and really really powerful probably more so than they intended to do because they understand that they need to appeal to the millennial generation and they have made programs that would not have been made by the bbc or channel 4 or made and given that sort of budget and made and given that sort of prominence like sea spiracy and rotten and the great hack these are documentaries about current social issues about the operations of multinational um, corporations about the damage being done by social media by the food chain by um, the international the global fishing industry these would not have appeared on television um, 20 years ago my partner makes wildlife films the reason i live in bristol is because bristol is the center of wildlife programming and her great frustration i should say her specialism is the history of southern africa one of the reasons why i'm so passionate about the historical roots of the mining industry because um, i'm afraid our first uh, our first holiday was driving around namibia um, so i've heard it all in great detail on very very long uh, car journeys but the, the the reason i live in bristol is because that that's what that programming is made and my partner's great frustration was this determination to make wildlife programming into escapism and that meant two things you didn't talk about environmental degradation and you filmed programs in africa but the one image you never allowed to appear were africans so that is beginning to change environment that we don't pretend when we make a six-part documentary series about the oceans that the oceans are pristine you see Africans in documentaries about Africa, um, the wildlife of Africa now. This is a huge cultural shift, but television from the 90s until about five years ago has enormously let down its, its, um, its function as part of the fourth estate, as part of what brings um, to the attention of people who have power because they have the ballot, um, absolute outrages in our age. But I would say briefly, if I can, as an historian, this is not new. The newspapers in Belgium and France and Britain knew what was happening in the Belgian Congo 
in the 1880s, 1890s, in the first decades of the 20th, of the 20th century. We should remember that the, what, what forced the Belgians to confront what happened in Congo was the work of a single British journalist. Uh, who, who was working within that world of global shipping, who worked out that what was going out were manacles and weapons and objects of punishment, and what was coming in was rubber and ivory. And he worked out that there was no goods being sent out to trade. So television has let itself down, but then the newspapers of the 19th century have let themselves down. I'm afraid journalism has not got a good record here. And there is a point as a journalist where you do what is important, not what is popular. And if you're doing what is popular rather than what is important, you're not a journalist, you're an entertainer. And then, uh, no, thanks. And then and looking at these, the, the specific or the, the types of issues that arise in, in these cases we've been discussing, I mean, do you think that the kind of conversations that have been going on uh, around racial and, and social justice issues that we've been seeing in the UK and the US um, uh, using you know, Black Lives Matter as, as an example? I, I mean, are there, are there links? Is this a, does this provide some optimism and some kind of model um, for kind of raising awareness and, 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 and motivating people to, to, to be interested in, in these issues? I think it does. And I think I think to explain Black Lives Matter, to explain why the merger of George Floyd had the impact that it did. The only thing that explains it is a generational shift. Young people feel about these issues very differently to their parents, profoundly different from their grandparents. And when they encounter this, they don't they don't follow the same synaptic pattern. I think what people from older generations have done is disbelief has has gone very quickly to disinterest. This can't be true. I don't want it to be true. I'm not going to engage with it. Younger people go from disbelief to anger really, really quickly. And then they go from anger to activism. It's a very, very different set of, of behaviors. And I think the job of journalists is to serve, well, the job of corporate, of commercial journalists is to serve their readership. Their readership is changing enormously. And the fact that the editors in their 50s, 60s and 70s aren't interested in these things is a generational failing. The audiences now, and Netflix get this, Netflix understand, um, that stories that would have just been dismissed, that I spent, when I entered television, I did so with a bundle of things like outrageous, historic and contemporary that I wanted to make programs for. And I spent the first 10, 15 years of my career being patronized because no one cared about this. It was you, grow up, stop being worthy. You're not a Boy Scout, you make television. It's about entertainment. It's about escapism. That doesn't, it's not true anymore. They, 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 were, they were morally wrong then. They're factually wrong now. Yes, uh, uh, in addition to the, the generational uh, distinction, when it comes to these uh, institutional investors, do you think uh, that the kind of the lack of diversity that uh, you find in the, in the city and financial centres uh, is, is also an important factor? Uh, to I, I think it is, but I think it's all sorts of diversity. I think I, I think it's also um, social class diversity. I think if you were, if you come from uh, uh, one of the former uh, mining or industrial towns, the so-called left behind towns uh, of Britain, trying to understand that communities can be devastated uh, socially, never mind just environmentally, by corporations, I think is easier to easier to understand. If you were from South Wales. If you grew up in Aberfan, the idea of uh, a village in Wales that was destroyed by a, uh, an accident in the 1950s, I think it's much more easy to understand um, what's happening in Africa. So I think it is, it's, it's about a diversity of, it, of social class and, a, and a diver, international diversity. But I think the, the, what's really important, and I think one of the things that gives me real, real, real hope is, is, is diversity creates international networks where, where these places where these things are happen are not distant anymore because you have family members there or someone you work with has family members um, there. It is, these places become more, more real when you encounter, um, when you have uh, a, a, a top table um, that is more diverse. And this, this creation, which is a function of empire of dead zones, where the people don't matter, where the rule of law does not exist, that is much more difficult when the people making decisions have real familial human um, investments in these parts of the world. But I think this changes a long, long way off because I think 2020 was a tipping point. I think it was a critical year. All sorts of policies are put in place, but I think corporations rather like television, um, they should have done this 20, 30 years ago. We are now going to pay 
for the the inertia of the 90s and the noughties, where people, all of these issues were known. Mm. And there was profound resistance to even to to giving up on the old ways of thinking and the old ways of doing. When we think about um, the historical legacy, uh, particularly of the mining industry, I mean, some of these things, you look at Cabway, for instance, we're talking about the company's involvement ending 50 years ago. I mean, how, how far back should should their responsibility go? Well, I think there's a, there's a thought exercise, which I think is worth doing. Some people don't want to do this thought exercise because they would regard it as um, false comparison, but I'm not making comparisons or equivalences. If documents came to light this evening that a company in Germany had been involved in some capacity in the extermination of Jews and others during the Second World War, which is 70 years, years, years ago, um, we would expect we would absolutely expect there to be compensation. We would absolutely expect that that company would make a statement, that that company would appoint um, a committee, and that that company, that committee would report not just an admission and an apology, but a plan for restorative justice. I, I remember being uh, in, in a discussion program uh, many years ago where a very old argument was put against reparations for slavery, where somebody, I was told, well, it's too long ago. Well, my response is, if you think it's too long ago, well, you must obviously support compensation for the victims of Mau Mau. Because even when these issues are more recent, mm. they will still be dismissed. Because what these arguments aren't arguments. They're not, people who say them don't believe them. They are ways of shutting down debate. They are ways of making things seem impossible. And what that does, it reinforces the the double think of the age of empire. We imagined it is impossible to compensate black people because we don't see black people as fully human. We imagined it is impossible to compensate Africans because we don't see Africa as truly part of the world. This is the mindset that we inherited from four centuries of rapacious capitalistic imp extractive imperialism. Oh, uh, a lot of food for thought there. Uh, and I guess we can see it in uh, right in the current times with the way uh, vaccines are being distributed around the world and uh, bars being put on um, allowing people to to make their own uh, enforcing patent laws. But um, that's another another subject. So um, can we move on? I mean, Nicole, I, I, you've kind of partially answered this next question that I posed about what is being done or should be done by investors, civil society, um, to ensure ethical and responsible behavior and legal accountability. I think you've, you've, you've answered that, but um, just as far as your own organization goes, what frameworks have you got in place, the PRI, to hold investors and companies to account if they don't meet expectations? Yeah, so, the PRI is very strong on accountability. I mean, to be a signatory to the PRI is to make a paid public and monitored commitment to implementing the principles of responsible investment. And that um, in and of itself requires that you um, walk the walk, right? And part of that is reporting annually to the PRI on your ESG integration activities. And as I mentioned, the issue of human rights protection is, be, uh, is integrated into that reporting framework with the idea that adherence to um, either the UNGPs or the OECD guidelines is a mandatory requirement for you as an investor. And the idea is that you push that onto the companies in which you invest. And PRI is very strong, but if you don't meet minimum mandatory requirements and expectations for PRI signatories, you are delisted, you're no longer part of this organization. Um, and I think that it's really important um, to understand that that's the approach that we take. And we also understand as well that the world is, as David mentioned, sort of in transition and that things don't change overnight. And so we work with investors to work with their stakeholders, with the companies in which they invest, with policymakers and regulators, with whole industries, with one another on the transition to where we need to be. We know what needs to be done. We're not always clear on exactly how to do that. And that's why an organization like ours exists is to help figure that out. Um, but we know very clearly now what's no longer acceptable. Um, and this idea of there being 
you know, sacrifice zones geographically or socially uh, is no longer an acceptable tenet of, of how, you know, the world that we want to live in and the role that investors play in creating and maintaining that kind of world. Um, and I think that's, that's why it's interesting to also see this movement around uh, the idea of ecocide and it becoming a, a you know, a criminal offence, a human rights violation. And I think that's something that's really interesting to us as an organization as well, because at the core of what we do are two things. The first one is uh, climate, the climate emergency, and the second is the protection of human rights. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. They are interconnected in every way. And so as investors and as a responsible investor, the expectation is that you understand that and you give it due priority and that you you don't just pay it lip service, as you've been saying, you, you know, you've really got to walk that walk. And I think um, you'll start to see a lot of, you know, increasingly we see a global divestment movement where uh, investors are divesting, turning away from assets that they don't think are going to make the cuts in terms of this transition. But increasingly, there's also engagement conversations that I think investors haven't been having with these companies and based on the examples that we're discussing today definitely didn't have <laughs> that I think that was part of the discussion I mean um we see what happens you know something like Lonman and the Marikana disaster I mean that if you told any investor that you had your crystal ball and you would tell them what was going to happen to the share price um based on this issue you can bet your bottom that they would have been prioritizing the, the SLPs um and I think that's it really opens their eyes. And it's really a, it's a, sh a, a real shame that this is what has to happen, that there have to be these horrible examples before we're brought to it. But to David's point, I think people are much more awake to it now, and um, especially the sort of incoming generation. Uh, and uh, we're not in a position anymore where we could say we didn't know. And that changes things. Thank you. Uh, Malaya, from, from your perspective, from a perspective of, of Amnesty International, I mean, you engage with um, activists, NGOs, the public, um, and, um, you know, you're renowned for, for your campaigning work. Um, so, I mean, how do you, what methods do you use to, uh, to get people to, to understand these issues, the public? Uh, NGOs, um, mm. and, I mean, do you lobby, lobbying governments and uh, at investors at the UN level and so on? There's a whole raft of things I know that Amnesty does. Perhaps you could just give us uh, an outline. Mm. Right. Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, just a quick one before I answer that on um, on 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 the legacy. So, if you look at the at Anglo's activities in Capoe, I mean, for two decades. Uh, this is the time when the most lead was released into the air and people are still suffering the consequences of that. Yet there's been no compensation um, whatsoever. Um, Zanele spoke a little bit earlier about uh, some of the half uh, measures that have been instituted, but this is again from a loan from the World Bank. So again, the government will have to pay that amount of money and not the company that actually uh, uh, did uh, the, the damage. Now, in terms of what uh, Amnesty does, yes, so, uh, you know, there's a lot that is uh, that we do. Um, so Amnesty, we try to research very forensically in order for us to be able to, to campaign. And we have over 10 million uh, members and supporters across the world who carry out actions depending on what we're campaigning on. Zanele earlier mentioned uh, the all of any case. Um, so uh, Nonflem Butuma was uh, a person, is a person that Amnesty has, for example, campaigned very, very strongly for, um, including, you know, looking after her and her family, uh, raising her profile uh, internationally, uh, engaging, including with TEM, which is the Australian company that um, uh, uh, is wanting to do mining in, in the wild coast, in, in the Eastern Cape. So um, there's loads that we do uh, in terms of letter writing, in terms of direct advocacy with intergovernmental organizations, with governments themselves and with corporates themselves. So for example, in Nampula province in Mozambique, we caused the suspension of a mining license uh, to a Chinese company called Hayu um, after its activities caused a flash flood that destroyed 48 households and put the lives of 2,000 uh, fisherfolk um, on the line. 
Um, the company had no environmental impact assessment that was done on it, and there was no government official, including the area MP that had visited that part of the country because it's 2,000 kilometers north of Maputo, which is the, um, um, the, the capital city. Uh, but by the time we went public with the report, uh, the government then became interested and we were called to go and present before a parliamentary committee. Uh, the activities of HIU were suspended. So the license was suspended because of the report that we had come, uh, come out with. With Lonmin, um, we had uh, our share of our uh, members in, in London attending the annual general meeting a few years ago where they raised very difficult questions about what had happened in Marikana and that caused a lot of damage to, uh, to Lonmin. So um, it shows that uh, if there's enough people pressure, companies as well as governments will buckle. And this is what we do and do very, very well as Amnesty International. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, right, so just, um, I think we'll need to close the discussion and move on to questions in a moment. But just very briefly, uh, Zanelli, um, oh, you've spoken a lot about, um, or mentioned the legal cases a lot, but do you think these legal cases, in addition to providing redress for individual claimants, have a preventative role that they that they also assist in um, making companies behave responsibly you know to be honest i don't know you know because i think multinationals the bottom line for them is key whether you know we are a nuisance and they are pay us off after you know stringing us along for a number of years or not um, I think it's a combination of the lawsuits as well as the social justice or social activism that goes on. And certainly social media has made things easier to put things in the forefront and to be aware and people to be campaigning against social ills that multinationals are doing. Um, you would think common sense would say to them, yes, act, responsibility, act responsibly or on your next project while you're dealing with these historical issues because if anything, they show that they won't go away, right? But I don't know, I'm not sure. I think uh, the bottom line, whether this is gonna cost them a lot to fight a lawsuit or not is what is key. And whether, again, they care who this affects. If it affects some African people somewhere who are dark and they're living in Europe or in the US or somewhere, they wouldn't care, I think. And you think that if they have to um, to shell out a lot of money in compensation and legal costs and uh, evidence emerges which shows that they behaved badly and their reputation is damaged, that that is an important deterrent? I think if they shell out a lot of money that makes a big dent, mm -hmm. right, in their pockets, they will definitely do that. If they shell out money that doesn't even make a dent, I don't think they will change because it's just mm -hmm. cheaper for them. I think, yeah, you're right. These cases are important in, a, in that they make them consider how much they're going to lose, right? But it has to be a big dent, I think, in my opinion, for them to pay attention, for them to want to make change. I don't think they care enough about social issues or the fact that they're affecting an, an entire race or even poisoning children for them to change. You need to tie it to the performance bonus and then they'll care. Exactly. Put it in, the, in the KPIs. Yeah. You, you need to tie it somehow to some monetary issue that will make them hurt, right? So if you don't tie it to any monetary issue, I don't think they care. Uh, and maybe some uh, effective criminal sanctions would be useful as well, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know what it is with, I agree. But then with that, there's another element that you factor in now. Now that is the justice system of that particular country, the government of that country. You know, multinationals get away with quite a lot, right? So you have to have a strong justice system to actually uh, be committed into bringing them to book, right? I think a number of African countries are trying right now to do that. Um, it's slow, but I think they're trying. Yeah. Okay, well, look, um, let's, we've got a, a few questions here, quite a few questions. Um, can, uh, first, I've got a question. Um, I found the notion of the colonial legacy very interesting and wanted to ask a follow-up on that note. 
Would you agree with the idea that due to the, rem the remnants of colonial era laws enabling the actions of multinationals, it may be accurate to speak of a form of post-colonialism? Taking into account the work of, among others, Nkrumah, I can see this argument as being very relevant. What do the presenters think? I th it's in the last decades of Europeans em European empires that the state is properly involved, particularly after the Second World War. And I think in some ways we, we, we misunderstand the private and the corporate nature of imperialism in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And so when we talk about uh, corporate um, uh, uh, imperialism and we, 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 we talk about neo-colonialism, I think it only seems new and neo because we don't understand um, what colonialism was like in the 19th century. It was always dominated by companies, just like mining companies that people haven't heard of them. People have heard of King Leopold and the Congo, but the companies that were involved in a atrocity that lasted you know, uh, more than two decades, that killed more people than the Holocaust, that halved the population of the regions of the Congo had affected. Um, no one's ever heard of those companies. Um, but it was run by companies. It was about private enterprise. So what we call neo-colonialism is not that new. The age of empire had the veneer of state power, but very often the st states were involved to protect their companies from the interests of companies from other countries. Also the borders between empires when it came to corporations, they were multinational. One of the few companies that is famous that was involved in the, in the, the Belgian Congo, though it's not at all famous or remember that it was involved, is um, Lieber Brothers, who were the great um, soap manufacturers in Britain. Now, the Lord Leverhulme um, built Port Sunlight, which is a model community with, with uh, literally an art gallery, a swimming pool, a temperance hall, churches, schools. Um, he bought to his, the subsidiary company created, took control of two million acres of the Congo and worked hand in, in, in glove with the colonial authorities in a form of extractive capitalism that was murderous, that was at times genocidal. Now, this was a British company in a Belgian colony. They were multinational and they dominated empire. We've just, we've over over exaggerated the role of the states in European empire. It was there as defender and guarantor. It was there to balance the interests of companies from different countries. But the work of empire was for the most part done by private and enterprise. And when the armies and the states were involved, it was to open the way for private enterprise. I'm Nigerian, I'm from a town called Ijeb Wode, was attacked by the British in 1892, not because the British particularly disliked my ancestors, it's because my ancestors were taxing Part the, the traffic of palm oil from the interior to the coast. Palm oil was the key ingredient in soap, again used by Lieber Brothers. My ancestors were attacked with Maxim guns because of taxation policy, not because of racial policy. And they were attacked because British companies, the British Niger, the Royal Niger Company, wanted access to the palm oil trade of West Africa. Corporations were at the center of this, just the, the, wor the work of killing and the work of unleashing the killers was done by governments. I suppose in the, in the present day, you know, where you've got such powerful multinationals often um, operating in countries that are extremely poor, desperate for investment and jobs and so on, that uh, the, the degree of influence that they wield and the uh, inclination of um, local regulators to hold them to account um, I mean, it, it, it means a continuation of the past, doesn't it? It does. I mean, today we've got we've had the news that Amazon has made 44 billion excess profits um, through the pandemic and has, has paid no tax in Europe. Now, if if Europe, which if you add Britain to the EU, as we used to do instinctively, that is a bigger GDP than the United States. It's the biggest market in the world. If that market cannot extract normal rates of corporation tax, one of the biggest corporations in the world, how is, how is a small country in Southern Africa expected to, to, to demand even the most perfunctory of, uh, of, of, of uh, best practice from corporations that have, in many cases, bigger GDPs than those companies? That terrifying list, if you put the 
the GDPs of companies and countries in a list, you can see that within the top 50, there are a great number of corporations far wealthier than most of the countries in the world. This is not an equal fight. And the idea that that law can that uh, that the laws within those countries can be uh, merely need to be harnessed and merely need to be uh, applied. Companies dare not enforce or draft laws that anger the, their, their, their corporate potential corporate partners. And we know this. We need to confront this reality. Um, and we and 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 we don't. And I I I I do see a cultural change within corporations, but this is like the Gilded Age. This is about choice. I don't think it should be about choice. I think it should be about compunction. This is not about companies but choosing to behave well. Companies should not be permitted to behave badly. Leah, well, I think you probably agree with that uh, last sentiment, wouldn't you? That um, what we need here are, are, are mandatory, uh, enforced enforced regime rather than than voluntary principles absolutely um i i totally agree and um in in the absence of that i don't see very much changing um but there can still be some change that happens because of the the sheer force of people getting angry and getting onto the streets and protesting so that could happen but i do think that um um, as I said earlier, uh, the, the the mixture of politics and uh, and corporations that is a is a toxic uh, mix that's going to be really difficult to get rid of because you find that in a number of cases, for example, um, in some countries they also fund election campaigns. Um, so uh, you know, dealing with companies like that is very very difficult. And like I said in the Nyasulu case, even the judiciary itself is not independent when it comes to actually reading out the law as it ought to be, uh, but they read the law as it will please the, those in, 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 polit in, in, in power. So to tell a company and to tell the Environmental Council of Zambia that you don't have any, uh, well, you made a mistake, yes, but we're not going to do anything because you're very politically connected. That is in itself is telling. So yes, we really do have to confront that. Um, and the only way that's going to happen is maybe continuing with what we do uh, in terms of getting the masses really, really involved, uh, getting on with strategic litigation as you do, uh, because sometimes even though it's slow moving, things do change. Um, yeah, I, I would say that. Good, good. Um, uh, Nic um, Nicole has said a few times that ethical, responsible investing is developing, but very slowly. I'd be interested in hearing her perspective on what she thinks ethical, responsible, responsible investing could achieve in the long term. What goals are you working towards? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the ultimate objective is to create a sustainable global financial system. And that is one that creates uh, returns in perpetuity. And the only way to do that is to integrate what we would traditionally have considered to be non-financial factors, so the environmental, the social, and the governance factors, into the processes of decision-making when it comes to investments and into our stewardship activities. It's a shift in thinking around um, to stop thinking like a trader and start thinking like an investor and really be in it for the long haul and think about how do I make sure that I'm living up to my fiduciary duty, which is about delivering what is in the best interest of the beneficiaries of my investment, of my clients. And that's really about taking the long view and integrating these kinds of things and understanding that there is no uh, long-term gain when this is the kind of short-term sacrifice that you make. Um, and that's for everybody. And I think, so the ultimate goal is for a system that is sustainable and inclusive um, and creates more than it destroys. I think that's the main thing. Why do you think the companies defend these cases so vigorously? It is not a personal attack on them or their own personal actions. Many of the people involved in the running of the companies have long died. But Zanelli mentioned that they seemingly sometimes take issues personally. And I wonder why she thinks this is and what is to be gained from this strategy. Why do I think companies take things personally? 
Well, well it's saying that the, the, the people who are now running these companies are not the ones who, right. who, who, did, who um, were involved in the wrongdoing when you're talking about historical. All right, I see. It is it, it is a very interesting question that you ask me because I've actually asked myself this. For instance, take for instance, Cowboy. In the last 50 years, the, a lot could have been done uh, to rehabilitate and bring justice to the people of Cowboy. What I've seen though, is that it is a question of we'll ignore it and it will go away, but it doesn't go away. And when it doesn't go away and we come and show and say to them, well, actually it didn't go away, this is the situation. There seems to be a scramble of them saying, we will fight you because we don't want to pay this. And that's why I said, I get confused because every time we go to them, it's as if we're telling them for the first time that you did this when they actually know that they did this. So I, I'm as confused as you as why they fight so hard, but that's what they do. And that has been our experience is that they would rather fight and delay. I think also costs are involved if I'm being cynical, uh, if a lot more people die before, you know, they can pay compensations cheaper for them. Well, look, I think um, we're already 10 minutes over time. So uh, I'm afraid I, there were a number of other questions, but I think I should draw this to a close. And first of all, thank uh, our four guests today for their really insightful, illuminating contributions from different perspectives. And, you know, we could go on, I personally could go on listening to you uh, for hours. Um, and um, you know, I'd just like to thank you for, for taking the time to participate in this discussion. And for everyone who's attended, um, listening, uh, I hope you found this as um, uh, instructive uh, as I have. And, um, and thank you all for, for coming. And um, I'm sure we'll continue these uh, conversations in the future in, in various uh, fora. So thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you.